Go of an A. Hello? Lasmid? How are you? Hi, Vinny. Nice to see you again, yeah. Nice you, nice you could make it. Uh, we have someone else here. He just went off to uh, do something, uh, but he'll be back. Uh, so welcome to our meeting, uh, we, the meeting time. Uh, we wanted to move it, you know, make it a little bit more convenient. Hopefully it is. Um, we have a few more sessions this fall before the new year. So um, if you want to uh, present anything, you're welcome to present. Uh, and then we'll probably continue in the spring, but I haven't finalized the schedule for that yet. Um, so I think, yeah. I think next week Ujwal is planning on uh, presenting or talking about his, he has a proposal he wants to uh, share with us on, I'm not really sure what it is, but but he's going to, um, he said he had to wait till his exams were finished. So uh, as a matter of an A, do you have any news uh, to share with us? Any new events going on or? Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad you could make the new time. And I would mention that Jesse, who's usually in our meetings, he went to Envision, which is a conference uh, at Princeton last week, this last weekend. So I don't know if he, I don't think he's made it back from that yet, but he's, uh, I think he's, did a, I, I gave him some materials actually to do a presentation there if he had the chance. It was sort of a free-form conference, so he may have been able to present. He may not have been able to present, but, but anyways, uh, I was kind of hoping he'd make it so he could tell us a little bit about it, but it, you can tell us next week. It's fine. Uh, Dick, did you have anything to, any news to share with the group? Uh, or? No, I'm working on a paper on the motors for diatom movement. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's coming along, but it's the history. It's called the whimsical history of diatom motors. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Actually, I could show you some pictures if you want. Sure. Uh, it's partly done. Okay. Let's see. Uh, let, how do I do a share screen on this? Oh, well, present now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, select window or screen. What? Probably the screen. I've got a list of 50 items here. Screen, <laughs> screen, two, screen one. Let's see what happens. Let's, oh, there it is. Got it. Okay. Hey, okay, now, next instruction. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You see anything? Yeah, it's coming up. Oh, that's the instructions. Okay. <coughs> okay, let's see. Let me make this bigger. So. Oops. There we go. There. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so here's how diatoms move. <laughs> 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 the cartoon by uh, yeah. <laughs> <Adam. laughs> okay, okay. Now here, here is I'm calling it the whimsical history. Uh, here's this. Uh, they used to well, when diatoms were first discovered, because they move, people thought they were animals. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, in these pictures, uh, let's see, what are they from? Uh, from no, there we go. These are these are from a paper by a guy named Baker, seventeen fifty three. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So these are his sketches of diatoms, and he he saw these little muscles sticking out the ends of the diatoms. Okay. 
Yeah. And uh, they, they can do all sort of jump cycle. I put in the, I call them the summer salting. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's, that's what he thought he saw. Uh, okay. Let's see. This is a guy who, Bori St. Vincent. Let's see. Okay. This guy, very famous, got Christian Gottfried Ehrenberg. Uh, in 1838, he decided that diatoms have feet like snails. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't draw any pictures of it, so I had to make my own fancy one here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. And then along came the idea that diatoms suck water in one out and push it out the other like a jet engine. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I found a diatom that looks a little bit like a jet engine. This is uh, Gamsunima. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh, and I thought at first that maybe the people who proposed this had discovered uh, 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 the principle of jet propulsion, but no, it goes actually actually to the I think to the 1700s. <laughs> <Right. Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> so, so jet engines were just the embodiment of ideas going back that far. Wow. Okay, another idea. This guy saw orbs coming out of the, the side of a diatom. Yeah. And this is uh, Mr. Hogg. And Mr. Hogg was, let's see, date uh, 1855. Yeah. So he, he saw he saw oars. So I put in one of these old uh, warships where there are lots of oars rowed by Many people, many guys sitting in the boat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's called a quadri. Oh. Interesting. And uh, nobody else ever saw this. However, uh, starting in the 1980s, people started seeing, here's a diatom, and there's little things sticking out of it. Okay? Yeah. And here's a close-up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe he wasn't so crazy, and the people, who, nobody else looked as hard as he did. I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so that's why I say it's sort of a whimsical history. Yeah. And then here's here's my model, where the diatom works like a candle does. Okay. Yeah. And the principle here, the way a candle works is, you got this molten wax and a wick, and the molten wax by capillarity goes up the wick. Then a chemical reaction occurs. Uh, the stuff, it gets hot, so the stuff goes out of the wick, wick and it burns, but that then leaves vacancies in the wick so more liquid comes up. So you get a continual motion of liquid up the wick being removed by a chemical reaction it's called burning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here's here's a diatom. I've oriented it so it's the same as the orientation as the candle. Here you've got this uh, little vesicles of this fluid coming in here, emptying into the slit, which is called the rafe, and they're fibrous, and when they touch the water, they hydrate, so they, they have a thicker line where they hydrate, and they're coming in at one end, and going in, and then all of them move up this way, and as they move up, if they stick to this surface, this is the this this bar is the substrate. Then that moves down. If there's little particles here, the little particles would move up. Okay, so it's the same thing. The width, this region here, acts just like the wick in the candle, and the stuff goes in and fills the wick, and then it reacts with water and becomes in a form that can't stay inside, and it comes out. So the reaction in this case is hydration with hmm. water. Yeah. Okay? And then it leaves behind the trail, the diatom trail, which is the sticky stuff that it leaves behind. And all moving diatoms leave behind a trail. Okay. Okay, so that's that's my model. Uh, I think that's as far as I'm so far. I have, this paper's about half done. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's all I've got so far. Okay? Well, that looks good, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've got, a, I've got a few more theories uh, to review from the literature. Uh, sort of listed here. Uh, yeah, okay. So so the uh, 
going back to the beginning then, uh, vibrating feet or protrusions. Let's see. Oh, wait, no, here we go. Somersaulting with protruding muscles. 1753, vibrating feet or protrusions, this would be like the snail, I know I should say, who does like snail, I should put here like snails, okay, uh, echoes to 1824, and, oh no, I got the crawling by, oh no, no, that's not this, no, no, that's different, oh, this is, this is uh, another one, well, I don't think they made any pictures, so I don't have any pictures to put it. They, uh, they kind of vibrate. Oh. This is a vib vibration mechanism. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then the snail foot. They crawl like snails. And then they act like a jet engine. And then they roll. <laughs> like, roll like a oh, robot. Yeah. And then the, the ones they have to do yet, uh, uh, models where they act like tank treads. Okay. Oh, okay. Like the ones that rotate. Yeah. And here's here's the one that I, this is the paper I proposed to you on the Sunday, I stated in 1983. So I put it back in 1883. Okay. Uh, there's one model where uh, uh, bubbles uh, make the thing move. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then if there's some modern ones, acoustic screaming, there's a floor scrubber model, <laughs> okay, treadmilling, swimming, okay, so that's what I've got so far. Oh, yeah, I'm missing, I know what I'm missing, yeah, uh, uh, the uh, uh, nuclear explosions. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. <laughs> there, there's actually... Nuclear explosions. <laughs> in the model, I have to put that one in. Yeah. Thank God I showed show this to you because I forgot that one. Yeah. This, this, is, uh, this one is, let's see, I'm going to show you that. Uh, I've got some slides here, but. Uh, here a while ago. Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, uh, so that's that one. Oh, yeah, rocket ships. Model, a model where they act like a rocket ship. Okay. Okay, and, uh, and here's a model uh, based on uh, a propulsion of rocket ships by exploding atomic bombs. <laughs> Okay, you drop an atomic bomb behind the the spacecraft, it explodes and it pushes the spacecraft forward. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. well, that was actually conceived of by Stanislaw Ulam in 1947. Okay. And uh, you know Ulam at all? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. okay, I, I actually post doc with him. Oh, uh, right. Which was a disastrous experience. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So that's all I got to show for now. I got to finish yeah. the paper. <laughs> yeah, that looks good. I think it's fascinating how people use uh, mechanical metaphors, you know, to kind of <clears throat> yes. guide their thinking on these th systems. Yeah, and also sometimes advanced ones like jet engines. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you said well, that was before well, they had invented the jet engine. Before, before, yes, before the airplane was invented. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's why I count Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, any rate, so that's that's that. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, that looked uh, okay, pretty sure. interesting. Let's see. Where are we here? Oh no. Uh, uh, Jesse. Jesse's Jeez. here. Okay. So now I'll stop. This Okay. So, uh, Jesse, you went to the Envision conference this weekend. Uh, and he said, uh, oh. Okay, Jesse said, uh, I missed the discussion, but Anders Sandberg, I guess he was a speaker at the conference. 
was talking about crazy ways to propel things like large astrophysical entities and even galaxies, apparently. But don't ask me oh. to remember the details. <laughs> okay. Uh, but who, oh, I'm going to look at the chat. Where's the chat? Yeah, it's on the right. It's on the right. Oh, there, right. Upper right. Yeah, upper right. Upper right. Alexander. Oh, okay. I have to look it up. Yeah. Have to create crazy ways. Yeah, I'm working on a I'm working on a paper on uh, uh, creation of black hole mini Earths. Oh, okay. The idea is that the, if you want to stand on an object, one with the so the the uh, gravitational force is the same at the surface of an object. Uh, as on Earth, but you'd like it to be a lot smaller than Earth. You got to have a source of gravity. Right. So what you do is you put a black hole in the middle of it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm working with an with an astronomer on uh, modeling how big a black hole can you use and what size mini Earth planet can you make with a black hole. Oh. Wow. Now of course you. Know, You'll have to be able to catch a black hole to do this, yeah. <laughs> or create one. Yeah. So I, I'm interested in Andrew Sandberg. You know, he's got to think about that. Yeah, it's obviously not uh, not for next decade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was a crazy idea. So far, one solution we got was that. Yeah, you could do it. You could get atmospheric pressure at ground level, but your head would be in thin air. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to find a more practical, see if there's a practical solution. <laughs> right. <laughs> where, where practical doesn't include how you get your black hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have uh, Andrew Sandberg. Yeah. Jesse said, I'm sure Anders would have something to say about that. So. Yeah, maybe we maybe use them for a reviewer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's see what this guy's written here. Okay. First so, uh, I, yeah, so I guess uh, I'll move to on to the uh, thing I wanted to discuss today in the uh, meeting. So, last week we talked about reinforcement learning. And uh, we, at the end of the talk, there was sort of this uh, discussion about feedback and cybernetics and the connections between cybernetics and uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, it got me to thinking that maybe there's a broader theme here. And I prepared some slides uh, that actually are interesting. I don't know how connected. I mean, they're connected to a lot of things we've talked about, but. Uh, I think it's worth going over. So let me present my screen. <clears throat> and uh, can everyone see my screen? <coughs> okay. All right, I'm presenting. Uh, can you see my slides? Yep. All right. Take, take the, hide the little thing at the bottom. Yeah. Let me uh, present. Okay, so this is, uh, it's taking a while to load here. Okay. So this is uh, between machine learning, reinforcement learning, and cybernetics. So, oops, we got someone else coming in. Let me, uh, Ujwal's coming in, okay. Hello, Ujwal. Hello, Hi. Oh, yeah, thanks, Jesse. You said awesome talk. So uh, I was just getting into this uh, presentation on uh, machine learning, reinforcement learning, and cybernetics. So uh, let me represent here. And uh, this is just kind of a bunch of things around this theme. And I just wanted to show people what the oppor you know opportunities might be in this area, what the current thinking is. There isn't a lot of thinking in it, but people are thinking about it. Um, 
So there's this uh, article I found. Um, it was by uh, Carlos E. Perez, who does a lot of writing on machine learning and deep learning. He runs this blog called Intuition Machine. And he wrote an article, What Deep Learning Can Learn from Cybernetics. And he, I think he actually does think a lot about cybernetics outside of his machine learning ideas. Uh, so he sees a lot of synergies between artificial intelligence and cybernetics. And he, in this article, he uh, goes through some of the history of uh, cybernetics and artificial intelligence. So for those of you who are unaware, artificial intelligence started... In the maybe in the 30s and 40s, where people started to come up with idea. I mean, the idea of like automation and uh, make you know creating artificial behavior started well before that. But you know, pe the modern field of artificial intelligence started back then, and cybernetics was a little bit later. But they sort of you know they developed uh, sort of together in some ways early on. So. Uh, in, in this article, he talks about artificial intelligence and cybernetics having different, you know, do, dealing with these different issues like representation, memory, reality, and epistemology. And artificial intelligence has some solutions to this, and cybernetics has other solutions to this. But um, Bradley, yeah? could, could, you, could you paste that URL into the chat, please? Sure. Let me Let's look this guy up. Slide. I'll grab this uh, link. I'll put it in here. Yeah, he does a lot of writing. Um, a lot of it's on machine learning, but there's a lot of other stuff that he's got in, in his mind. So uh, it's worth looking into. Um, but okay, let me go back and present... Uh, so the point he's trying to make here is that there are a number of different issues that are dealt with here in, in both fields, and they've dealt with them in different ways. So, uh, you know, there's this basic notion that you have to have cognitive systems that are autonomous. Uh, and then in artificial intelligence, you deal with that in uh, ways that, so for example, cognitive systems have an inside and an outside, and that's uh, sort of referring to embodiment. Uh, organisms map external objects to internal states. That's being dealt with in artificial intelligence terms in both representation and memory. Uh, but in the cybernetics, you have things like organisms mapping through an environment back onto themselves, so sort of a feedback mechanism. And nervous systems reproduce adaptive relationships, and that's part of memory. And so you can see it's a very complex uh, figure, but he walks through kind of the differences in the two fields. And so at some point, you know, these fields were kind of developing together, and at some point they uh, converged. So he actually has this uh, graph that in that article that shows kind of the development of AI, which is this function, and like sort of landmarks in artificial intelligence. And, you know, they're sort of mapped to the development of of uh, AI in terms of, uh, well, there's like, a, so the Macy conference was a um, conference that happened in the 50s that, uh, you know, is a cybernetics conference. Hold on a minute. I have to do something. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. I had to uh, do something. Uh, so let's go back to the slide here. Uh, so the Macy Conference was a, a get-together of all the early people in cybernetics, and this happened in the 40s. Um, at about the same time, you had the McCullough Pitts neuron, which is the uh, a standard model of sort of how you have a, a neuron that, you know, uh, system of neurons that are connected together. Uh, well, I'll show, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Uh, but 
it, from about the 30s on to about the 60s, there was a, a connectionist viewpoint that was being developed. And this oftentimes was in conjunction with cybernetics. So you had a lot of ideas that uh, were very compatible with cybernetics, uh, where you had a bunch of neurons that were connected, and people thought that they were going to solve some pretty big problems. Uh, then you had some criticism of the perceptron, which was this uh, McCulloch-Pitts neuron sort of developed a bit more. And uh, this is the onset of symbolic thinking in AI. So this is where you had people who thought what you needed to do is have a symbolic system rather than a connectionist system. Uh, that, you know, that, so there was a shift in AI at that time, and it kind of sort of uh, severed the link between AI and cybernetics. Then eventually, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you started to get these statistical models like support vector machines, and they became uh, prominent, and their connectionist systems like deep learning or like uh, neural networks, but they're divorced now from AI, from cybernetics, and they sort of operate on their own um, in their own space. And so um, that's basically what this graph tells us. Let's see if they had a comment in the comments. Let me get that comment. Oh, yeah, Jesse Parent. Yeah. <laughs> so he's really excited. I saw that a long time ago. I was looking for it. Nice. So glad I could help. Um, like I said, these are just ideas. So uh, please feel free to explore them further because I'm not going to do them justice here. Um, so... This is a, an image of the McCullough Pitts neuron. And so this is one of the earliest uh, devices that we have that are like artificial intelligence like. And the idea here is that it, it, it resembles a neural network. And it really is like the first neural network, but it's a very simple model. The, but the McCullough Pitts, actually, the, the paper that they published, uh, the first paper they published on this, uh, argued that neurons and synapses are actually logical computing devices. So up until that time in neuroscience, they were developing, uh, you know, ways to view neurons, to stain neurons, to see what the function was. They were exploring different types of neurons. Um, but they hadn't really thought too much about the computation. And this is the first paper to argue that neurons and synapses are logical computing devices. What that means is that if you take a bunch of inputs and you weight them, and you put them into this uh, black box, you get a, a sum, and then it's either above threshold or below threshold, and that gives you an output. So there are different logical uh, rules that you can combine to weight them to make sure that, you know, uh, they're, they're summed properly and that there's a proper response in terms of a threshold. Uh, so, but, but McCullough and Pitts were actually the only people thinking about that. Um, uh, and nor is this the only thing that you need for like a nervous system or some intelligence. Uh, Gordon Pask, who is a, another cybernetics person, he published a book called Conversation, Cognition, and Learning. And he argued that intelligence resides in conversations or what we might call interactions. So his argument was that if you have a neuron like this, it's not enough to really give you very much. I mean, you can, you know, do very simple like classification with something like this, but you need a bunch of neurons in parallel to get a good, uh, nice, you know, representation. And of course, this is the way connectionism developed, right? We have these uh, neurons in parallel, and they're doing processing, and that's where your intelligence resides. So deep learning is really an instantiation of this idea, where you have a bunch of layers of neurons that are communicating and their, their conversations are being filtered by some algorithm, by some set of thresholds, and we're getting an answer. And so, you know, a deep learning algorithm, another way to think of it is like a giant cocktail party where people are talking and you're extracting information from those conversations. Um, but Alan Turing also thought about this. Um, he thought of this, he came up with something called a B-type unorganized machine. And this is actually something that's been lost to history somewhat. Um, there's an article, this is a, more of a philosophy of science article 
but uh, this, this goes over the B-type unorganized machines quite well. And what his vision of, of like a neural network was, was that it's the simplest possible version of a nervous system, uh, which consists of a NAND logic gate with a modifier. So this is a B-type unorganized machine, and you can array them in parallel or however you want to array them. But this is basically the simplest possible version of a nervous system. And so you can have multiple B-type unorganized machines to have this more complex nervous system. But basically, you have these units that are connected bidirectionally. And each unit is a NAND logic gate. So for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a logical command that's... Um, it has it's an and it's a modified and function so you have um you know some things passing through and some things not passing through this gate and then you have modifiers here which are i guess sort of weights i'm not really sure how he envisioned it but uh and you put them together you get this very simple input output uh system you get an input you get this processing and then you get an output um Okay, so uh, now I'm going to turn to deep learning and, and the more uh, recent um, sorts of developments. And I want to talk about a paper that's interesting here. Um, I found this actually was an article, like a, a popular science article about this, how a lot of people in machine learning are getting excited about this in, uh, method called information bottleneck. And it's a theoretical idea that says that you you know, how do deep learning networks learn? Uh, and they go back, to, actually this paper was published in the year 2000, and it has nothing to do with deep learning. But it's a it's a theoretical work that's sort of been obscure until recently, and everyone's gotten really excited about it, although it's been fairly well cited since then. So it's been kind of like toiling in the background, and now people are getting excited about it, you know, um, more popularly. But... Uh, this is actually an archive paper from 2000, uh, Naftali Tishbe and William Bialik. So William Bialik is a actually a biophysicist, and he happens to have also worked on this problem. Um, but the idea here is that the information bottleneck method actually describes sort of how information theory can be applied to deep networks. So they proposed this idea that you basically in a on a learning network or a deep network, you uh, retain features most relevant to general concepts using a version of uh, compression called lossy compression. So you take your data and you put it into this network and you take out all the extraneous information and you leave only that information that's structurally important. And, and there's a debate on what that would be, but I think what they're kind of getting at is that they're features that sort of really, uh, you know, are central to the, the data set. Like, you might strip out a lot of the outliers or variants, and you might end up with a, a very, uh, you know, uh, specific representation of what this problem space looks like. Uh, and then, of course, you can also, to generalize this, you would then take this uh, compressed signal and reconstruct it. So instead of uh, representing all of the diversity in the representation, you take the data set, you plug it into this model, you then compress your signal down into the essential features, and then you just try to reconstruct the signal, uh, and that's your way of generalizing the problem. And if this sounds familiar, that's because this is kind of how it works in deep learning. It, it's sort of implicit in the model, but you'll see in a minute that it's actually, they've actually found some rules or some some uh, statistical regularities in this process. So the most important part of learning here is forgetting. And that means that uh, when you learn things, you encode the important features of learning, but you also have to forget other things. You have to forget things that are extraneous to the problem. Um, and so this is their sort of theoretical result. Um, this is a figure from this Quantum Magazine article. This is the recent iteration of this work, sort of like revisited. Um, and they basically argue that their networks converge to an information bottleneck theoretical bound. What that means is that you have this bound where you can train a model 
and you can compress the data. Uh, but if you compress the data too much, you uh, sacrifice prediction accuracy. So the idea here is that you're trying to find the optimal compression of the data. And beyond like a certain, you know, level of compression, if you compress the data too much, you've lost your prediction accuracy. You, you suffer in terms of that. Now, this sounds, of course, like uh, compression algorithms in computer science where they try to compress data down into a smaller package and you can do it in different ways that are lossless meaning you lose new information but there are lossy techniques that also can reconstruct images but if you take too much out of that image then you've lost your image or your data and so you're getting data loss and that's basically the idea that they're working from here um, so they propose that there are three phases to this. Uh, one is a fitting phase, which is where the networks learn labels, just like your typical learning phase in a machine learning algorithm. Uh, then you have a compression phase, which is where networks become good at generalization. Um, so this is, again, like the training phase of a ML algorithm. But in between, they propose that there's a, tr a phase transition. And in physics, that term is used to denote some sort of change in state, like from a solid to a liquid or from a gas to a solid. And there's a uh, sort of a, it's a, a rapid change that occurs. It's sort of at a critical point where, you know, you say like an ice cube is sitting on a table and it gets warmer and warmer until, you know, you get to a point where the ice cube collapses into water. And it's so it's not a it's a gradual process, but there's a critical point where it transitions. Um, and so that that's what they're arguing for this, that it, theoretically, between your your training phase and your learning phase, I guess you could call it, uh, or your training phase and your testing phase, you have this phase transition. And that's where the network begins to forget its input. So the network is actually forgetting some of the aspects of its training so that it can do well in the testing phase, which is a generalization of the problem. And this graph on the right is uh, it's, it's a, uh, basically a trade-off graph where you have information about input data and information about output label. And they're showing these points here where they're testing different layers of a network. And they're looking at the results in terms of uh, you know, different phases of the problem. So, you know, you have some layers that do, you know, less well than others. And I, I'm not going to go into the paper really deeply here, but I just wanted to make you aware of this paper. Um, I'll make these slides available later so that you can look at them, uh, get the citations for this paper. Uh, but then there's another paper that's interesting, and this kind of follows up on this idea of forgetting. Um, and it's called Selective Brain Damage. Measuring the Disparate Impact of Model Pruning. So this is an archive paper here, but there's also an open review. And the open review papers are interesting because they're published with reviews. In this case, they're conference paper reviews. So you can read what people thought about it. Uh, the One of the open reviews here actually said that this paper has a uh, novel finding, but it can't be applied to anything which is like, I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> I think it was to a machine learning conference or something. So let's just say that one person's treasure is another person's trash or something like that. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, the lesson there is, you know, submit it to the right place. But uh, anyways, uh, so what they're, they're talking about in terms of model pruning is that there's a neural network technique called pruning and that's where you can remove a vast majority of weights in a network, whether it be a brain or a, a neural network, with little degradation to accuracy. So we might ask, like, what if you take nodes away from a neural network? Does it have any effect? And the answer is usually not. Uh, you can con reconfigure the network in a lot of ways, and, and you can make, you know, compensate for losses in the network. Um, this is also true for the brain. Uh, when... Say, for example, someone suffers brain damage and part of their brain is removed. Their brain, depending on what part of the brain it is, can reroute that uh, network through other existing pathways and cobble together something that resembles functionally 
the original function. So it's actually an interesting, uh, fascinating, actually, uh, feature of networks that this can be done. But you do have a couple of uh, a, a relatively rare set of examples where you have some things that really, when you remove them or when you introduce them to the network, they take a hit. So in this case, what they're doing is they're getting these pruning identified exemplars. And these are actually uh, input exemplars that when you take a network and you uh, remove certain parts of it and you start putting in information, the information is processed as if the, the network were normal. But when you bring in these PIEs and you introduce them to the network, the network performance degrades quite substantially. And so the, the, uh, the pruning can actually have two effects. One is to remove parts of the network that are essential to function. And so if you remove those parts of the network, the network is degraded for everything. Or you can have these exemplars which are introduced to the network as inputs. And when they go in to a degraded network, a pruned network, they can either work well or they can, um, you know, blow up the model, basically. Um, so what are these uh, PIEs? Well, they, they tend to be hard to generalize images. So they're, you know, maybe unique images that have a lot of features or they're mislabeled images. So it might be like we talked about uh, false positives with, the example from uh, adversarial networks or from pareidolia where you mislabel something like you have this thing where you have a thing that looks like a face but it's not a face so when the algorithm hits that example it doesn't know what to do with it or something that requires more detailed classification so there are a lot of things in the world that are not well classified and so that's one of the examples that they give um, so this is a, actually a compression technique, and they tested this pruning process on ImageNet and ResNet networks. So ImageNet and ResNet are both image-based uh, uh, pre-trained models, as we talked about in another meeting. And they use this pruning technique. This, they, you know, it's a compression technique, so it's compressing your data in, in, a, way, in a very abstract way. Uh, and you want to see if it's resilient to this uh, compression. And so their conclusion is, is that there are unknown trade-offs governing pruning and network resilience. So this is the part of the paper where I agreed with that reviewer that it's, uh, they didn't really explore this trade-off very much in the paper, but uh, they, they do mention it. And the idea here is that there's a trade-off between like taking things out of the network, like maybe key nodes or key edges, you know, whatever those happen to be, or just, you know, extraneous nodes or edges, and the amount of resilience exhibited by that network. And there's one area in the literature that they could have cited or that might be a follow-up to this, and that's if you Google the term complex network resilience. So if that term actually, I know, yields a number of papers, some of them in, in brain networks, some of them in, in electrical networks. It's a wide range of complex networks, but They've done, they actually do experiments where they take, like, they build models of these networks and they remove nodes and edges from them systematically. And they look to see, you know, which nodes and edges, if they're removed, have a catastrophic effect on the function of the network. So sometimes if you remove up, like, maybe half of the nodes, it doesn't have very much of an effect. Things can be rerouted. If you remove one node in the right place, it can, destroy the network as a functional entity. And one way to think about that is uh, electrical networks, where you have uh, blackouts occur because you have some node in some location that, you know, might seem insignificant, but it's a place that's maybe in between two electric grids. And so if you take that node out, you can uh, have a huge blackout. And so that's a kind of, th that's the idea we're getting at here. There's more follow-up to be done on this idea, but it's uh, and it, it does relate to uh, cybernetics in that we're talking about, you know, feedbacks and complexity. So um, yeah, that there's nothing on that in terms of the literature, but uh, this is an actually an example of pruning though. Um, there was another paper called Optimal Brain Damage. People like this 
idea of brain damage. Um, although it's not really brain damage uh, in this case. Uh, so in biological brain development, uh, pruning actually is a common, it's actually normal. Um, and this can be, this is actually used as an analog to neural network pruning for excess capacity. So what happens in development is you have this, this is a model of, I think, visual cortex in a human infant or in a human fetus and then into an infant. So into a, a young child, actually. So this is the fetus where you have neurons, you know, appearing in the uh, visual cortex. And you can see that they have very sparse connections. The, the cells are just being born. And then the newborn, you have a little bit more connectivity. Then as they start to interact with their environment, uh, their postnatal environment, they start to gain a lot of connections. So from three months to two years, they get this massive number of connections between the cells. And that's, you would think, well, more connections are better. But actually, that's not true. More connections are needed to explore the space because, you know, you're not born with visual representations at this stage. You develop them, you know, as you get older in, in early childhood. And so what happens is that you know, your developmental system starts to grow all these connections between three months and two years. And then after that, these connections are pruned. Once they're the visual, the basic visual environment is, is specified, the pruning, there's this process of pruning where the, the connections that are extraneous are taken out and the critical connections are retained. And so this happens over a process of many years in early childhood, mid-childhood, and you end up with their visual cortex being able to do some, you know, pretty efficient transmission of information. But it requires this overgrowth and pruning. And perhaps because the brain is a self-organizing system, that's that's necessary. But we can make use of this in artificial systems, too. Um, so you can make computational models more compact without losing accuracy. You can take a model overgrow it with connections and then compress those connections. And this is analogous, of course, to weighting your connections and filtering them through thresholding. Um, but uh, in the vertebrate visual system, of course, it's used as a refinement mechanism. So more connections generated in early development than needed in adulthood. And so the idea is you overgrow things and then you prune them down to an optimal number. So where are we? Um, and this is another figure, I can't remember where this comes from, but this is a big complex map, which is suitable for what we're talking about here. Here's cybernetics and information theory. Um, and then, of course, there are all these connections to different areas. So we don't even really have uh, machine learning on here. We have artificial intelligence as a subset of cybernetics. But we do have all these complex, you know, um, we do have all these ideas. So, you know, we can go from cybernetics to artificial intelligence to computational theory. We have neural nets, something called hierarchical temporal memory, which is a form of uh, AI we might get to maybe in the last meeting. Um, and then that, that all re results in something called emergence, which are self-organizing systems. So I put this slide in here for Jesse largely because I think he'd find this useful to think about, like, all the connections between things. But I want everyone to think about it, like, you know, think about machine learning broadly. You know, don't just think about it as training a model or testing a model. Think about it in terms of this heritage of different ideas. So um, just wanted to give a quick overview. I think that's, uh, let's see if I can... Stop sharing my screen. All right. So let's go to the comments. Um, let's see. Okay, so we start here. We talked about the Jesse had a comment. Then Dick had a comment. The, origi the original perceptron was at the University of Illinois. I saw it when visiting Ross Ashby. Jesse's awesome. Uh, Richard, maybe Bradley can check in if and it still exists. He's in Urbana. Yeah, so about the the lab that you're talking about, um, 
So there was a lab in uh, uh, UIUC years ago on where they did a lot of early cybernetics. Um, and I think Ross Ashby was a visiting scholar. And they've actually, uh, what happened was they had a, a, a significant amount of military funding and they went into this late 60s and early 70s and they started proposing things that were, I guess, not really in the military's purview. I don't know what that means, but I think they were exploring their mind um, and they were coming, you know, they were kind of moving more towards like maybe uh, social theory or other areas where the military was less interested. So they stopped funding the lab and the lab, the guy, you know, the person who was running the lab got old and it, the lab closed down sometime in the late 70s. Um, now, they actually, there was a history, uh, history of science person on campus who's documented the history of the lab. So I'll send out a, a link to that. Uh, they have a really good documentation of the lab and its history. So I can send you that link. That would be interesting, I think, to a lot of, to Jesse and maybe to Dick. Um, and, you know, anyone else is interested. It's just kind of goes through what they did in the lab. They did a lot of the, you know, they were involved in a lot of developing the first computers. And, um, so, I, I don't know what ever happened to the legacy of the lab. I mean, they're now, you know, they have something called the Coordinated Science Laboratory on campus, which is, uh, you know, kind of a mix of uh, different topics. It doesn't really involve much of what we think of as cybernetics, but it's, you know, there are things like game theory and information theory. So it's, uh, you know, there's that. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll send out that link. So, uh, Let's see, Gordon. Fishby at all sounds like just computed tomography from a limited number of views. And this equals reconstruction of an image from a limited number of projections. So I think that's, maybe that's what they were getting. I think they were trying to, they were thinking in terms of information theory, in terms of their model for, for like, you know, how information is processed. So there's a lot of the, like I said, there are a lot of ties to uh, information compression and compression algorithms. So before, um, you know, computer memory got really massive, uh, people worried a lot about compressing their data because you had like very small window, you know, very small buffers of data to work with. You couldn't really just throw anything into it. So you had to really compress your data. And so that's where a lot of that literature comes from. And still, even if you use a zip file or if you use an image file, there are compression algorithms behind those that compress the data down to this sort of essential set of bits. And so that's kind of, yeah, they are talking about something very similar to that. Um, so Richard, again, if pruning identifies critical nodes, is there work on replacing critical nodes with circuits that reduce criticality? Um, I'm not sure. I know that people have done work on, like, um, like, I guess they're, I don't know if they're called chaos chips or like they're chaotic circuits. So there's been some work done on that where they're looking at, um, you know, like resilient chips and resilient architectures that sort of reduce this um, threshold, you know, to criticality type stuff. So I don't know the state of that. It's not like, I mean, I have some readings on it. I, you know, I can send people readings if they're interested, but... Um, I, I don't think it's a, it may be at the forefront of like, uh, research and sort of the chip industry and that, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that is a, that is an, a thing that's of general interest is like finding networks that are resilient to failure. So like, as you can imagine with electrical networks, it's very important to keep those running, but also like other types of networks that are, you know, can fail. So Jesse had a comment. Uh, These maps are super helpful. I forgot if the session is recorded. Yeah, I can give you a recording of this uh, slideshow here. Um, so I can actually send you the slides as well on Slack. So you can have the slides and um, follow up on these things. So uh, Richard says, see my, then this is the Gordon and Stone paper cybernetic embryo. Uh, also, so this is in his folder uh we didn't like we don't 
have a direct link to the folder, but those of you who have the folder, I think I can send a copy of this out to people. It's a book chapter, so it's not readily available, but this is the first version of the cybernetic embryo paper. So there were two versions of this, one where Dick worked with uh, Rob Stone on it, and the other one where I worked with Rob Stone on it. And this is the first one, so I can send that out to people who are interested. Um, and then he's, Richard says, send me your email address if you want access to my online papers. So if you could put your email address in the chat so people could contact you. Okay, very good. And you can contact Dick Gordon if you want to be added to his repository. And so uh, the one more comment. Uh, the ILIAC with 64 parallel computers was from the University of Illinois. And it, yes, that's true. He, uh, the, the, some of the earliest computers were uh, made in different campuses around the country, and the University of Illinois was one of them. So, okay, so uh, that, that was a good session. We're at the top of the hour. Um, does anyone have any other comments they'd like to make? Or Asmin Ojewal, do you? Okay. That's good. Yeah, yeah, Jesse, no problem. Okay. All right, well, thanks for a meeting. Uh, talk to you next week. Follow up on Slack or email. All right, have a good week.